introduction to humorous poems by michael ignatius brennan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b humorous poems by ignatius brennan to my reader my first jingles were written along about the time grover cleveland was serving his first term and my friends used to tell me them was some rhymes they were of course i wrote of the mill by the rill of the stars above and my own true love of the beautiful moon in the month of june etc several of these i sent to the leading magazines enclosing postage to ensure their return and afford me the privilege of seeing them marked not available i decided that sir literary critic was a joke thought often if the whole bunch of them would take a deep-sea excursion some time and either sink into the sea or do the robinson crusoe act my vengeance has cooled however and i assign these two reasons for that old time and the way my first volume mountain state gleanings same publisher as this was handled by them in that volume i told these destroyers of flowers born not to blush unseen but made to do so by them that my own hard cash was paying for the publication and that they could all go to benton harbor or some lake port warmer my judgment of them was wrong they treated me fair and square so here i am once more with the second installment penned while you wait and on all those things that appealed to me during the past two years i was out of the writing end of it for two years having been in kentucky were you ever in kentucky if not shake if so and you didn't have to tramp home shake again tis the wrong climb for one who sees the humor in most of the things in which there is humor i heard but two hearty laughs while in the state one came from out a drunk who lived in new albany indiana and another from out a poor demented fellow en route to the insane asylum near louisville my most sincere prayer to almighty god is that everybody may eventually make heaven their home and that each one gets the same size harp and crown but should it happen that those harps and crowns are graded woe be unto the one who draws either or both larger or better finished than those assigned a kentuckian and i'll bet my old low cuts that before one of them is in heaven twenty-four hours he will be wanting a rebate on his harp or suing some one for damages the above may seem strange to some of my readers my taking a slap at kentucky in my preface but i felt it my duty to explain my two years absence in verse i have explained and my explanation is true however the rhymes follow take them in homeopathic doses and you may survive i am sincerely yours ignatius brennan huntington west virginia december nineteen fifteen End of Introduction The Gossip by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona There are characters and characters we meet with every day Till we'd guess it was intended that we jog along this way like there's no mind like another no two faces just the same and the flesh is not distributed alike on every frame some were cut out to be sprinters while some others couldn't run if their very lives depended on the way the thing was done more were fashioned for mechanics and a few to practice law with legions for the ministry and more to stack the straw and well no use to name them all or what they be about but there is one special character that we could live without and that's old mrs grundy who is pictured with a chin and knows with merely room between to let the victuals in but let the scandal sizz from out like hot escaping steam 
and the more they sizz and sputter why the more her features beam she carries round a jimmy with which she is adept to open up the closets where the skeletons are kept and speaking confidential like that's tween me and you tis hard to find that closet thout a skeleton or two and if there's any chance to rehabilitate it all she does it with artistic taste that adds much to the pall she has to stretch the ligaments in places quite a bit at other points the meat she has cannot be made to fit but she fixes up the front at least to give it grundy tone especially the features but she leaves the back alone now when this job's completed and she starts to make display tis done in tritest fashioned and in regulation way then when this work is finished and the devilment is done she'll gently thrust this one aside and show another one revamped and reconstructed that it looks as if brand new tis shown the board of censorship they put her latest through so tis thus ad infinitum and in ad libitum dose some gulp it by the dozen and some others by the gross her sphere is of proportions unrestricted in its scope in fact we'd say unlimited with closets yet to ope but one bright springtime morning when the birds were at their best and the sky was at its brightest from the east unto the west we noticed in the papers that this lady passed away and we chuckled dio gratias and inwardly hooray though this notice ordinarily will rigidly suffice we had to see the evidence we saw and said how nice in cases like above described we must be circumspect a heavy slab went o'er her grave for fear she'd resurrect end of poem this recording is in the public domain the shoemaker by ignatius brennan read for LibriVox.org by betty b what has become of the old-fashioned lad who sat on his bench with his bristles and wax sewing on patches or rents that look bad adjusting half soles with his pegs and his tacks sitting all day with his legs stiff and numb pulling wax ends through the groove in his thumb taking our measure with cardboard and thread and keeping the measurements all in his head keeping yes keeping we said the thing right as we ne'er wore a pair but was either too tight or sizes too large per the wrinkles displayed but we'd won satisfaction we'd had our boots made and too the leather had come from old pide tanned on the shears where you give hide for hide we've sat rainy days or when business was poor and watched this old boy with his whackety whack while his quid of tobacco a half ounce or more would furnish saliva he'd spit through the crack in the floor where his heel by close contact wore through for he sat in that spot since the lumber was new we've sat while he'd tear off the old worn-out sole sat while he put his crude patch o'er the hole watched while he'd grab that old curved blade and trim the sole to right size which seemed pastime to him list while he'd spin off some yarn or a joke while his awl or his hammer would ne'er miss a stroke the half sold and healed in those days of yore was seventy-five cents no less and no more he's gone no he's here but in different role no wax ends or pegs all's bristles or last course he still chews tobacco and spits through the hole but that's about all that remains of the past you step in his shop and you yank off your shoe his lordship will give it one splendid review then say a few words to a lad shaved and clean who stands at a complex electric machine then on with the dance midst a whir and a buzz a difficult problem to guess what he does back comes your shoe like the robinson spring polished revamped and well everything no more spinning yarns and no joke telling goes one twenty-five 
and tis brought to a close the high cost of living and leather and rent explains why he's added this eighty per cent end of poem this recording is in the public domain the man you owe by ignatius brennan read for librivox dot org by kurt from tucson arizona ain't it a peculiar thing as you walk down the street so neatly haberdashered from the head unto the feet not wishing no far from it to display your latest stuff but just to look the gentleman and make the proper bluff that the very first man you will meet and last one to we'll trow is the one you'd wished in proctorville or in old jericho the man you owe you see him and he knows it and you know he sees you too there is naught to do but face him and it's simply up to you there's no alley way that you can take and give the man the slip so you pull yourself together and continue on your trip you give a bright good morning sir that sounds to you so well his morning you interpret as he means it go to this man you owe and the look that he will hand you from his side eye as he'll pass would pierce the hardest copper plate or melt a kiln of glass then he'll lapse into soliloquy and murmur to himself that fellow looks as if he had a pocket full of pelf and you're taking inventory as you jog upon your way a thinking when your ship will dock so's you can go and pay this man you owe now we can't speak for other folk who sometimes go in debt who have their statements coming in that simply can't be met but we feel so much better and our conscience will not fuss when we meet the poor unfortunate who is in debt to us then when we meet this other chap who gives this killing look whom we find it is impossible to dodge by hook or crook this man we owe there is sure a hindu hoodoo man with magic wand somewhere who causes those in debt to us to vanish in the air for every time we mooch around where they should be about the word comes from the typist girl that all the men are out we ask her when will they be back she gives some sharp reply that very much reminds us of the look that's in the eye of the man we owe end of poem this recording is in the public domain nothing to wear by ignatius brennan read for LibriVox.org by betty b we're not going to say who she is or is not although it would no wise surprise her we merely will tell her unfortunate lot in an instant we all recognize her our hearts beat in sympathy ere and anon for her as she's surely a much troubled one she's bowed down like miller's poor man with a hoe with one special worry to her the worst woe it follows her ever though skies be so fair tis this the poor creature has nothing to wear she belongs to this club and this musical set she has friends without number about her on every program she's there you can bet they'd not be successful without her she's chairwoman here and toastmistress there and she fills either place with a dignified air she sits in the box when she goes to the show at home in the dance or wherever she'll go she's twenty full costumes her neighbors declare yet even at that she has nothing to wear the curt invitation comes in right on time had she missed she'd have felt she'd been slightened of course she must look as she did in her prime with herself she will then be delighted but her wardrobe she can't wear the dress that she wore when she dined with the smiths or took tea with miss moore nor the one she bridge whisted in out with the rose nor the one that she euchred in up at anne flo's 
nor the one that she pokered in down in kildare it truly is sorrowful nothing to wear we've ne'er in our lives seen a cloud anywhere but some place we'd find on its lining a streaking of silver but here we despair in her case we fall to repining we know that when gabriel slips neath her door his card for a party on his brightest shore where all will be robed in a set of white wings a harp and a trumpet and song-book and things that only belong in his prize land so fair we'll gamble she'll tell him she's nothing to wear end of poem this recording is in the public domain the banker by ignatius brennan read for librivox dot org by betty b the banker stands back of his filigree mesh with countenance rosy and wisdom so fresh plucking away at his adding machine figuring totals on yellow and green but never too busy to turn with a dash and enter amounts of your checks and your cash then hand back your book with so gracious a mien that you think you are part of his banking machine business is booming the silver rolls in you'll see it piled up like big stacks of block tin with gold sitting round in an affluent way and the greenback stacked up like you used to stack hay cashier and teller and all that you see are well just as busy as busy can be even the porter is shining the brass his manner is that of the vanderbilt class you're wanting some money to purchase a home it rolls out as free as the tiber through rome you've asked for two thousand your note reads that way you get eighteen eighty then some one will say the best thing to do is to leave that amount with us thereby starting a checking account of course your first mortgage that's pinned to your note is a matter of form as the banker will quote but hark something drops and we read in the press that on the horizon are signs of distress the mill and the mine in the once busy mart are closed and god only knows when they will start in fact your own job is in jeopardy too and the bank sends you word that your paper is due appended in script are these words trite and staid the directors suggest that your balance be paid paid then you'll say they're not talking to me just wait till i see mr banker and he will merely suggest that i pay what i can and give a new note on the old-fashioned plan but the sunshiny fellow who made you the loan and took your first mortgage is chill as a stone you stare at each other with countenance blank and from then you pay rent to the man at the bank end of poem this recording is in the public domain the confidential monger by ignatius brennan read for librivox dot org by kurt from tucson arizona we know you've often met this chap who'll call you to one side and tell you on the strictly confidential that's after he's informed you that in you he can confide the latter is his patented essential that so-and-so has happened in his straight-laced neighborhood and the good folk are in perfect consternation why no one or suspected him no reason that they should and she was thought the best girl in creation why he sang in the choir and she taught sunday school but well there are exceptions to every set rule you'll listen to his story tis hard to understand why he should be so worried like and fretful because you'd often done far worse than issue this command upon your conscience try and be forgetful as in this case you bid your much sub roseate friend adieu and put his tale aside within a minute too thinking he had told his silly tale alone to you you placed it on the file of nothing in it but by evening the thing had grown to such size that think as you would you could not recognize you're mystified you know he told the story just to you and you know you never breathed it to a human this confidential chap had made the rounds and pledged anew 
each one to secrecy, both man and woman. The reason for this secrecy we afterwards found out was this, that placing all in pledged condition gave him special privilege to tote the stuff about. Yes, this was the real essence of his mission. He gave it to you as a secret profound. This left a clear field for his passing it around. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Our Barber by Ignatius Brennan. Read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. In his neat laundered coat and all shaven and shorn, with his trousers all creased and his shoes shining bright, he's right on the job from the earliest morn till the clock clangs eleven on Saturday night. He's always good humored and never seems vexed, though he says fifty times in a day, Who is next? You drop in his chair, he adjusts you just right then he piles on the lather in copious way he mentions massages and tonics at sight then out comes his blade and tis on with the fray this blade gets your spinaches every one that is in the case where the handle stays on now during the day that the shaving is done he'll talk if you're willing and often if not he knows every athlete and battles he's won he's up on the war and how many are shot and oft times he knows of where no fights were fought but at that there were many who came back half shot he knows all news current from politics on will talk on religion oh once in a while he knows every prominent man in the town he's trimmed his prize locks in his own special style he's there on diplomacy versatile coy arguments nix for this foxy old boy he's one of the few left in business or trade who'll tick with a smile if you haven't the price it ne'er turns a hair when the statement is made see you on saturday put that on ice he's a spoke among spokes in old industry's wheel this night of the tonics massages and steel end of poem this recording is in the public domain In Wrong As Usual by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King One time I used to think that when I'd get enough of cash I'd be like most of wealthy men Cut right in and play smash I'd buy a horse and buggy too And drive like folks with money do Well, time went by and fortune smiled As best she could on me Until at length my cash was piled up to such a degree that I could buy a horse and rig. But traps were then the style by jig. I drove that horse and buggy round amongst those high affairs whose rubber tyres ne'er made a sound along the thoroughfares. While my old iron-rimmed buggy made discordant sounds of highest grade. I said... I'll do the proper thing. I do not care a rap if I go broke. Along next spring, I'll buy myself a trap. I did, and to complete my plan, a pair of bays, a handsome span. Well, when the wood had doffed the brown and donned the purest green, when wild flowers flecked the della down and songbirds sang so keen to give the god of nature praise, we hitched the trap behind those bays we drove the iron tired buggy like i owned the year before was seen not once upon the pike twas now a thing of yore but what struck me most queer perhaps was what became of all the traps the ones who drove in them last year i passed upon the road in autos of the highest gear thought i well i'll be blowed if I ain't out of style again, I swore off buying there and then. My friends would say the autos are the real thing for joy, each trying to sell a special car. Thinks I, no, no, my boy, I'll never make a change again until I buy an aeroplane. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. She wore a hobble by Ignatius Brennan. Read for LibriVox.org by Elaine Conway, England. She flits up the street, looking, she thinks, petite, and she thinks coquettish and pert. Togged out in a hobble, producing a wobble, correlative now with her skirt. Her dashing light pose in a hat to her nose, symbolic of Parisian tact. The boys follow after, enveloped in laughter, produced by her vaudeville act. The kids take a look and to remark, get the hook, as she hobbly rushes along. The women turn piker, the men are just like her, for Lassie is playing it strong. If some judge should say, she must tog out this way, to do public penance also, and trot twenty squares to the main thoroughfares, what power would drive her to go? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Jollier by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Elaine Conway, England Whenever you meet him, he's always the same, with a smile playing over his features. At church or at wedding, at business or game, he's one of those light-hearted creatures. He's always adept at extending the hand, and never fails to tell you, you're looking just grand. He asks of your welfare, the folks that are home, and pleased, you can see when you mention that all are well, thank you, his mind will not roam. While you talk, he is all at attention. He never forgets to so happily tell how pleased to have met you, then bids you farewell. You say to yourself as you start on your way, jollier he to a finish. He seems so prolific in nice things to say. His stock seems to never diminish. But down in our hearts we all rightly confess that he did us no harm, with his chic cheerfulness harm no not he but the question will rise did he or didn't he mean them he spoke out so frankly and looked from his eyes the truce with naught thrown in between them how far better he than the bilious like lad who greets you with mercy you're looking so bad now if there is one creature under the sun who gets a wide berth if i see him first tis the dyspeptic disgruntled one i pat my own back when i flee him this fellow who weeps when your business is good and casts a deep gloom over the whole neighbourhood this fellow who hears of all things to depress of accidents sickness troubles and even though we shun him, tis sad to confess, he's legion on legion of doubles. His brain has no intake for sunshine at all, but stands out against it, so like a stone wall. Now, all can accuse me as much as they please of being affected with jolly. I've never said yet to a soul words like these. You're looking so bad, no, by golly! For God knows this old world is tough enough, true, without some fool lobster a telling it you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. He did wrong, we think. By Ignatius Brennan, read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. He'd heard that many a flower is born to blush unseen on the desert air, and he heard again, and by some forsworn, tis best to live and to die forlorn, e'en though it savors of chill despair, than to blush where blushes would be seen. We'd rate his author as emerald green. 
he'd court the muse in the deep recess where the songbird sang to soothe his pen and his muse was the one of cheerfulness and sentiment who'd guide and bless the feet and hearts of gracious men who'd stop and heed her pure advice then this lad doped it all so nice he'd sing where the daisies flecked the dell when all the world was hushed and still and we hear his songs were rendered well all perfect harmony they tell he sang about the time when the whippoorwill was wont to sing his notes of joy we'd figure the fellow a foolish boy he'd dance and again we hear with ease his movements were grace personified but the dance was done when the evening's breeze was chanting its requiems to the trees or about the time the day had died we'd wreck his jig with a lonesome dance why not grab a partner and take a chance he died and like all he was put away snug and safe in his earthly bed and the words of praise that were sung that day of him were the greatest and best but say the subject for all this praise was dead had he raised the bushel from off his light in life he'd have measured the thing just right now we don't believe in the loud bazoo that bellows and bleats as a know-it-all nor we don't approve of the main gazoo whose set opinions are right and true in every case but we would install a method by which when you've learned your book pass it on so's the others may have a look end of poem this recording is in the public domain circus day by ignatius brennan read for LibriVox.org by kurt from tucson arizona along about thirty days ago when barnum billed the town and said they'd be here may thirteenth with elephant and clown equestrians and acrobats and trapeze folk galore i said no nix on circuses i've seen them off before my friends would question time to time in meeting by the way if i was going to see the show of course on circus day and to each questioner i'd give the answer sure but slow and that was in one single word a firm emphatic no well may thirteenth like other dates arrived right bang on time i watched the thoroughfares grow dense with folks from every clime from babies to grandpas and dames of every hue and shade all lined along the curb to watch the circus day parade i heard the band i forged my way to where i'd get a view i heard the herald sound approach and watched the whole thing through i saw the gilded carriages with mirrors big and wide and bands on top dispensing airs with discords on the side i saw regaliaed elephants and humpback camels too and our beloved uncle sam in red and white and blue i watched the handsome uniforms i saw a hindu queen whose name would sound if spoken right like brennan or colleen i saw the boys with lariat and girls in gaudy clothes in spite of all i stood stock still ejaculating nose and saying that i would not go if price was but a cent but when i heard the calliope i fell from grace and went end of poem this recording is in the public domain the tube skirts passing by ignatius brennan read for librivox dot org by kurt from tucson arizona how dear are the things that fashions deny us when fond recollection presents them to view for instance the tube skirt that hung on the bias and curtailed as much as the dressmakers knew the boot slit displaying so unsentimental a crisp bit of silk from blood-red to sky-blue 
and others, of course, at the barred oriental, and so to the skirt at the top of the shoe. But step halting, tube skirt, dear hobbledy tube skirt, dame fashion decides we must bid you adieu. How often we've lingered when cars were receiving miladies of statures from thick to the thin, as poised on the curb we would never be leaving, till all the dear ladies were seated within. The curt panorama that passed for our vision of cottons and silks and the whole proof, and all is left with the past with one fell swooped decision the hobble passed out on the last day of fall the cute little hobble the funnel-shaped hobble that figured so proudly at seashore and ball they send in its stead the full gourd and by jingo it takes twice the goods as the yardstick will show and while we're poor versed in the dressmaker's lingo we'll take this one chance on what little we know the thing is outlandish that is for fat people and as for the thin it will hang like a rag look bout like a canvas thrown over a steeple and when in the wind will be like a gas bag so so long miss hobble to you and your wobble we're clearing the decks for the one with the drag end of poem this recording is in the public domain Play Ball by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona Same old bug has started working. We can feel it in our veins, and our whole frame gets to jerking as we listen to the strains. Poured forth by those pink sheet writers as they jot in prose or sing, of these husky diamond fighters, the true harbingers of spring. They have had an uphill battle, hunting dope since way last fall, but no more tis simple prattle, tis the real thing. Play ball! We have surely had some weather, since Sir Groundhog came at least, from the city to the heather, north and west and south and east. We've had ad libitum blizzards that have tested well our frame, but we find we've improved gizzards since the tidings of the game. Sure enough, we're tired of freezing, men and women, one and all, and we're longing for the season and the day we hear play ball. Most all folk have special hobbies. Some have this and some have that from the wise guy of the lobbies to the wrestler on the mat this lad's bugs about the ponies this one has the auto craze this one and his boat are cronies this one loves the tango's lays but for us just blast your tennis golf and boats and cars and all sit us down with fritz and dennis where we'll hear em yell play ball Place us back of third and seated on a cushion hard as stone when the warming up's completed and the game is rightly on. Peanut bag and scorecard handy watching fowls and muffs and flies, hearing spiels from Pat and Sandy as they guy the batter eyes. Should dear Gabriel sit down by us, whisper in our ear his call, we ask him not deny us, say just one more game of ball. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Office Spittoon by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould We had a spittoon near the stove, a full twelve inches wide. At that the boys would miss the thing and spit around the side. So one day we philosophized and took our yardstick out and measured from the farthest splash to farthest splash about. It showed two feet from splash to splash, and so we then set in and had the tenor make us one from strongest Welsh block tin. 
We had the porter scrub the tile till it shone bright once more. We then hauled in the latest build and sat it on the floor. But fate is fate, no doubt of that. The two feet wide one failed. The boys cut in with broadside splash, and all in mass assailed it fore and aft, till by the night tobacco juice ran down, its sides the same as had it been the smallest one in town. We drew on our resourcefulness to improvise a plan, by which we could devise a scheme and not insult the clan, but place something they couldn't miss, and right within their aim, yet trying all suggested things they missed them just the same. We bought a tub, a galvanized, twas billed as number one. Twould hold about thirty gallons, and when full would weigh a ton. But same old tale for round the rim that rested on the floor, the nicotine would ooze and stick like everything before. So out it went. Out went the stove. We put the steam heat in. We put no tubs or pans whereat the large spittoons had been. We had some big signs painted, and we placed them in a frame. No spitting in this place allowed. They spitted just the same. They'd spit behind the heater, and they'd spit along the wall. They'd spit smack in the corners where we couldn't clean it all. At length we took the twelve-inch ones that we took out at first, and put them back. Hung up this sign, Gall Dern ye, do your worst. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Holiday Grin by Ignatius Brennan, read for LibriVox.org by Maria Fatima the Silva. Isn't it queer? At this time of the year, we cast off all cunning and wiling, and join with the rest with a smile that's our best, and just keep on smiling and smiling. There's something, and not hard to find out just where, for tis wafted and wafted about in the air, that causes us all to be childlike again, and act like as God ordained women and men. We jog down the street, and we never once meet with one whom we class as a rowdy. As cheer fills the air, on the street everywhere, while we smile and come out with our howdy. Why, folks, that at other times scarcely we know, and those who are our debtors and those whom we owe, display the same grin of the artless-like kind, the year-to-year -year grin with no motive behind. Now take Mr. Grump, that dyspeptic old Trump, who knocks things from here to the isthmus. He's rightly aglow, as his fizzog will show, and this is the reason, tis Christmas. And two, the tight landlord, who take our last cent, and that in advance, for his coveted rent, is beaming and happy and chipper-like, too, till you'd think the poor fellow was human like you. And the knitted-browed stuff, with that equal right stuff, displays a benignity, never seen through the year, but she's shockful of cheer. How nice could she stay thus forever? So since we're all wearing this hallowed smile, let's hold to it always, not once in a while. To start with, let's all make one, catch as can try, to hold it till after the 4th of July. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. You're Looking Fine by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Maria Fatima da Silva You'll sometimes meet this character, the fellow with a smile, who grabs it January 1st and holds it all the while, whose handshake is a remedy for aches and pains and ills, redounding with more real good than salts or liver pills. This lad who's cornered sunshine when the cornering was good, who's loved by all from young to old in every neighborhood. For this reason, he is happy, and he makes us happy too, when he hands this message to us that's a help to me and you. You're looking fine. You meet him from the morning to the latest hour of night, 
though other folks look gloomy he's the essence of delight his philosophy is this sort when a thing is done it's done what's the use to hunt carbolic or a big blue barreled gun though the sun today is hidden on the morrow it will shine be game and try it over or you're not a friend of mine and we heed him and start over as his friendship we'd not lose for we mustn't miss this greeting when we're troubled with the blues you're looking fine we've often met this fellow when our pulse was beating low when our step was so vivacious was unsteady like and slow when we knew our cheeks were hollow and our skin a saffron hue and our conscience hinting to us that our charon trip is due while the other folk who'd meet us would pass on with looks askance when they'd note our necks proportions and the bagging in our pants they could have said in though they fibbed oh boy you're getting there but no they're not built that way but we see our friend and hear you're looking fine again we've seen him meet the one with one foot in the grave and the other mighty close it just a walking round to save expenses of a funeral and trying to circumvent the old gent of the hourglass and the scythe on mischief bent but this makes no special difference to him of sunny way he'd tell him of a ball game that he saw just yesterday or of a little poker stunt in which he held four kings against some other boys for aces then he'd say amongst other things you're looking fine perhaps it may sound foolish when we say this lad is right he who hands us all this jolly but we cash the thing at sight and that without a discount then we court his debt again for what are we but children who have merely grown to men though our whiskers may have bulk enough to make a butcher's mop and our pate be like a boulevard and glossy on the top and our wisdom be as sagey as old aristotle's there we are always glad to meet this lad who shoots right on the square you are looking fine end of poem this recording is in the public domain the expected letter by ignatius brennan read for LibriVox.org by maria fatima da silva i'm looking for a letter from a chum who borrowed ten and promised to return it sunday week i've written and rewritten asking over and over again to send the ten and stop my losing streak he hasn't yet acknowledged and i fear he never will unless perchance a postal card to say i owe you still i'm hoping for no letter though i know that one is due it comes a print statement and to wit we itemize your buying on the enclosed billy do and stenciled on the bottom please remit i'd like to walk right in that place with check to square the bill but i'll have to telephone them that i owe them still i'm waiting for a letter from the folks at home sweet home i asked them to send me fifty p d q they told me i'd go busted when i started out to roam but the letter well the letter's overdue and i fancy when i get it twill contain a dollar bill and penned before the signature these words we love you still i'm looking for a letter from a girl who loves me true i asked her right upon a certain day i know that letter'll reach me sure as one plus one makes two unless the mail should chance to go astray she never disappointed and i know she never will and this is why i pen before my name i love you still i'm looking for a letter from an uncle growing old and i've been named in honor of him too of course i always reckoned when he'd die i'd get his gold but the letter says with best regards to you i was married last september to the belle of centerville and the old scamp has the nerve to say we love you bill 
I'm looking for a letter from my firm about my pay that reads about increasing of my wage. I get one, but it's framed, oh, just so opposite, and say, the boss must be in one terrific rage. He says, dig up more business and more cash, and then his quill jots down, get out and hustle, or we'll can you, Bill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Brian's Resignation by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Maria de Fatima da Silva We can't see why they chew about Bill Bryan's resignation. We're sure it will bring no changes in the complex situation. Tis just another stunt of his, so void of bad intentions. Alike indeed the one he's pulled at different conventions. We all recall his cross of gold he sprung out in Chicago and did it with an eloquence outrivaling Largo. His ginst our flag on foreign shores and used in 1900 his ownership of railroads when so many said he blundered. We mind how, down in Baltimore, he flayed the Clarks and Ryans, the Belmonts and all Tammany, well, all these things. Brian's, and though he's out pro turn a while, we'll worry not a minute. He'll bob serenely some fine day and be right strictly in it. The note is sent to Germany. We hope it will prove entrancing, signed and sealed officially by Secretary Lansing. Suppose the whole dying cabinet resign? Who'd care? This nation has thousands others just as good. To grasp the situation. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. There Jitney by Ignatius Brennan. Read for LibriVox.org by Maria de Fatima da Silva. The Jitney car is with us, where both constant and I, the fickle, can do the a la millionaire for one small paltry nickel. They race our streets and avenues for everything that's in it. It seems to us that one goes by about every other minute. In fact, our eye seems jitneyized, or else it's sadly failing. All autos look like jitneys, and we've done some awkward hailing, and got some mighty wicked looks from orbs erstwhile so pleasant. The kind you see in picture books, but transformed some at present. We've scanned the passengers who ride by this cheap transportation, all creeds and cults and clans and race, from all walks in creation. Hans and Abe and Jack and Pat, and all a looking dandy, Sari, Jane and Amaria from up along the sandy. The Nabob and the Plebeian, the Gambler and the Preacher, our candidates for office and our Sunday school's best teacher. They all enjoy the auto's chug, no matter what the weather. Up in front or in the rear, cheek be jowled together. We like the smell of gasoline and sniff of heated babbit. And those who jitney long enough are sure to get the habit. We'll skimp a trifle here and there, say cut out booze a little and chop the luxuries and put more cabbage in the kettle and praise the patch that's neatly put upon our sunday breeches then in this way accumulate until our store of riches has reached the size where we can buy a car that is a hummer then while the rest are going some why we'll be going some more End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Did this ever happen to you? By Ignatius Brennan. Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King. Did you ever rear back in a well cushioned seat, with cigar working right, so refreshing and sweet, with your hat in the rack and a brace for your feet? on the first outbound train in the morning, 
Now your stomach is feeling so cosy and fine, your conscience is clear, and your heart right in line, your newspaper filled with the stories you crave, in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Then, without a herald or warning, some lobster will give you a slap on the back, with a hand like a ham, and a crash without knack, and pass you a guffawish, how do you do, as if he'd a fatherly interest in you. And, where are you going? And then he will flop himself by your side, and commence talking shop. Of course you tell him you're feeling quite mean, that you're bound for Paducah, or old Bowling Green, two hundred miles off, and you'd hoped in between, this point and your fixed destination, to snatch a short nap that you'd thought would refresh your mind and your limbs, and your bones and your flesh, and thereby feel better when you would arrive at the end of your journey that evening at five, then work so befitting your station. But, hint as you will, it is all of no use. It falls like the rain from the back of a goose, and the lad with the slap and the shop sits serene. He's bound for Paducah or old Bowling Green. He makes himself easy and sits by your side, is so entertaining the whole of the ride. The news that you wanted to read is unread, and the nap, well, the nap never entered your head. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. You're Looking Bad by Ignatius Brennan. This recording for LibriVox.org by Elaine Conway, England. Jether meet this character, this fellow that we'd guess, his stomach or his liver had gone out of busyness. This fellow who's been leader of the Anvil Chorus long, whose special occupation is to see that things go wrong. This fellow whom you're bound to meet about twenty times a day, and every time he'll stop you and come at you this away. You're looking bad. Of course, we knew you met him, but just stop a minute, please. This fellow, as we called him, isn't limited to he's. For in these days of equal rights and other things to vex, this fellow isn't limited to either special sex. For we've oft seen Mrs. Ladybug, who's built the self same way, and morning, noon, or evening, she's this cheerful line to say, you're looking bad. We've often met this fellow when our blood was running red could turn a dozen flip-flops without lighting on our head, could bowl on any alley, say at least two ninety-nine, and knew without a shade of doubt that we were looking fine. But down the street comes bilious, and the very first danged thing comes out this trite expression that we've heard from spring to spring. You're looking bad. Now, we wish bad luck to no one, and we hope we never will. But this fellow gets our goatee from the Billy Goatee Hill, and we know that you'll excuse us when the truth to you we tell. We've often wished this fellow was in Catlettsburg or, well, this thought too's a depraved one. We confess, but here we state... Won't St. Peter fix this fellow, as he'll whine in through the gate? You're looking bad. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Auto Philosophy by Ignatius Brennan. Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King. We never owned a limousine or any other car and hardly think we ever will, while things stay as they are. We never look with covetness or envy in our eye, whene'er we see some fortunate 
in auto whizzing by. We've often wondered what was paid for this and that machine, and what it costs to keep it up for tyres and gasoline, and manifold accessories it needs from time to time. Then hazard this, we hardly think he earned it, writing rhyme. We've oft times tried to figure just about the way we'd feel a driving our own auto with our own hand on the wheel and puncturing the ozone as we'd spin along through space and just about how long it would take to get the motor face. Two, we'll confess, the smell of burning gasoline to us makes us Rockefellerish and Vanderbiltish plus. We like to see the phone poles pile up like a fine tooth comb, but so far we have either walked or took a streetcar home. We've stood upon the corner as we'd watched the cars go by. We've listened to the comments of the boys afoot like I. We've heard them cuss and damn the rich who ride in the machine, e'en though perhaps their uncle was supplying gasoline. And though a hundred thousand men are working with a might, turning out these autos with orders yet in sight, but we've made the men a study, and we find them all alike. They all enjoy the high spots as they jog along the pike. Another thought, pathetic one, that lingers in our mind as we see these monsters whizzing by, a burning up the wind, or hear their owners boasting how she rides without a jar, is my, the job the poor cuss had a selling that fine car. How they'd stall around, connivingly, to beat him down in price, till his profit wouldn't halfway pay his bill for one month's ice. There seems a parasitic streak in most all humankind, and those who are born without it seem to trail along behind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Not Like I Used to Do by Ignatius Brunan Read for LibriVox.org by Carla Patton I often question what is wrong. I find I cannot jog along the way I used to do. While music sounds to me more sweet, it does not seem to stir my feet the way it used to do. To sit it through a two-step now puts no chafed wrinkles in my brow the way it used to do. A broken date with Lady Fair will cause no tearing of the hair the way it used to do. I'm not as fond of oyster fries, nor do I much those hot mince pies the way I used to do. I do not like the center rush where all are getting in the push the way I used to do. I note when 10 o'clock rolls round, my bed and I at peace are found. Not like we used to do. A shoe of ease is just the thing. The latest lasts no more will bring. The joy it used to do. I worry not of styles in hats, nor blending with your suit cravats, the way I used to do. If my best coat and pants are whole, that's all I ask, contented soul, not like I used to do. Shows may come and shows may go. Opera stars like Caruso move me not, and circus days appear enveloped in a haze. Bands may play and songsters sing. Fire alarms may ring and ring. Fourths of old July may hum. Baseball games may stir me some. The preacher's talk of kingdom come is all that worries me. I asked the sage about all these. He answered, beg your pardon, please. But to this morbid, doleful rhyme, the answer is, old time, old time. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
He's Always First by Ignatius Brunin. Read for LibriVox.org by Carla Patton. We know you've met this laddie buck. If not, you must be blind. This lad who's always right in front and never back behind. This lad who's first one through the stall at every baseball game and first one out and on the car to get there seems his aim he knows exactly where the car door's going to open wide he's first one on the platform and of course the first inside a dozen women may stand around with babes in their arms he's looking out the window at the building or the farms he's first one into the hotel to register his name he's first one in the dining room and first of course to blame the waiter for his snail-like pace and first to raise his voice in protest against the victual served should he not get the choice he's first to leave and knows just when the time his waiter's out this makes him first to dodge the tip that we all kick about he's first well why grow tiresome when you know the chap we mean may his tribe show a decrease is a wish with his serene tis queer about this fellow how he does these stunts with ease if we should ever tackle them we join right in the squeeze we cannot recall of sitting in a car unless mayhap some folks may think us sitting when we're hanging to a strap we can't remember when we got a room at a hotel except the one you back from when they ring the breakfast bell our memories hazy about the time we sat in a pew just made for five but ours had six the one in front held two we'll bet a lincoln penny on the final judgment day when we're turned loose this lad will be the first to lead the way and when the good saint tells him that his record isn't straight and points across the highway towards the elevator's gate that opens just to those who are not entirely clean from sin as soon as the gate is opened he will be the first one in he knows for once he's last one out he'll neither push nor shove he hopes the lower place is full with rooms to let above end of poem this recording is in the public domain all the while by ignatius brunan read for livervox dot org by carla patton some people talk on panic all the while till with them tis quite organic all the while they will say that money's tightening in a way that's simply frightening and though the skies are brightening all the while they will talk on money market all the while and hunt up the things to dark it all the while they'll spring all things in creation and then charge the situation to the new administration all the while they'll damn the men with money all the while who live on milk and honey all the while they'll cuss the cashiers and the tellers from the cornices to the cellars though they'd all be rockefellers all the while now as to our own condition all the while we've held just the same position all the while there's no need we should deny it though the long green all ran riot our money markets quiet all the while end of poem this recording is in the public domain the mustaches return by ignatius brunan read for livervox dot org by carla patton away back in the misty past when whiskers flourished thick and fast and almost every man you'd meet would have them good and strong we boys would look with longings to the day our bunch would be due and tease our upper lips a bit to help the crop along 
till finally with pride and dash we'd had a full-fledged man's mustache winner we'd go to see our girl we'd have the barber wax a curl on each end so it's to have us look the dashing cavalier but someone spread this thing around mustaches with microbes abound and one by one we parted with our matadorish dear our girls made no kick against the change but loved us closer not so strange but now we note they're coming back the purest blonde the ultra black though not the same prolific brush as in our sporty day they look as if they had the grip the way they halfway feel the lip it may be just consignment one the balance on the way we much prefer the olden style large and full and worth the while end of poem this recording is in the public domain the collector by ignatius brunan read for livervox.org by carla patton he raps on the door in a way you'd suppose the best friend on earth is in waiting outside or the boy with the message to quickly disclose that your long-lost rich uncle in klondike has died leaving a fortune a million or two in cash and he's no other heir only you you rush to the door with a tea party smile that speaks of prosperity comfort and wealth and air castles piercing the clouds all the while consisting of seashore and places of health autos and servants and hotels the best your cares and your troubles are marked up at rest but how do you do says the man with the bills i'm here to collect your account long past due you need not complain of hard times or ills that is if your tale isn't perfectly true for this gent with the statements has heard every woe and knows if you're telling a falsehood or no he's there to collect and you may as well dig if you have it in bank or encased in your holes though it takes your last penny he cares not a fig as his living depends on the old debts he'll close there's no use to cuss and give vent to your wrath for then tis the squire as the last aftermath we've often thought if the spirit we've here continues as ours when we ferry the six if so for this lad we have no little fear for the habit acquired may put him in a fix unless he for once will be quite circumspect he'll say to st peter i'm here to collect end of poem this recording is in the public domain Uncle Henry Talks by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Corey Michael Morrill Uncle Henry Talks on Sermons Pick up your daily papers and scan their pages o'er Sermons, sermons, sermons by the dozen and the score On this text from the Bible and this and from the law And myriads of others from no place I ever saw Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, and on, on through the week you're always in a radius where someone's due to speak. And tisn't just the mornings, but at every hour of day, these fellers with their sermons are just bound to fire away, until their words are scattered to the winds like so much chaff, and have about as much effect as a movie phonograph. They've got their wisdom twisted, sure as you're as sitting there. There's never much accomplished where they use too much hot air. A little bit is wholesome when a feller's growing cool, but too much spoils the temper just the same as too much school. Or too much anything at all is worse than not enough. You can spile a stone by a cut until it's less than the rough. You can sharp a scythe so keen like the edge will bend and break. And there's such a thing as putting too much sugar in your cake. There was never saying truer cut from out the primest cloth about too many cooks always spilling of the broth. 
I like the old time system when we'd meet just once a week, where we'd have a lot of praying and then hear the preacher speak, then sing the Rock of Ages and the Royal Diadem, abide with me and so forth and every one a jam, and say about every second year just fetch the sinners in, along with them it backslid and work em o'er again, then settle down to business when the plowing time was good, and seen just who could prosper most around the neighborhood. Then when we'd feel like singing, just yank our hymnal down, and glory hallelujah till the old hills would resound. Americans will listen just so long and though they stay, for manners they're listening, but listening to other way. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When You and Me Were Boys by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Corey Michael Morrill When You and Me Were Boys I met a fellow yesterday I knew long, long ago, And then he had it on me, say, a dozen years or so. I mind when first I voted back in 1892. His whiskers were about like the ones I picture Esau grew. He was a candidate for justice of the peace that very year, Was running round the precinct like an old electioneer, we called him Squire from that time on his majority, was safe as per the tally sheet and figured twenty-three. We had to shake hands when we met in midst the talk and noise. His topic of discussion was when you and me were boys. We went to school together in the old-time common way. While I was in my ABCs, he ciphered algebra. I recall his commencement day, I wore my red-topped boots, and waist of mother's make and one of her best handmade suits. He gave the valedictory while I looked on with awe, and counted him the smartest chap that I had ever saw. He married Katie Simmons when I was in fourth grade. I was present at the wedding, no, I mean the serenade. But now I note the thing that he most thoroughly enjoys, is telling other folks about when him and me were boys. Now he may prate the way he will, I know how old I am, and far as that's concerned don't give a continental damn. But the danger point about the thing is this, when at the ball, and I am doing bunny hugs and turkey trots and all, he might be there and doing the old wallflower stunt complete, and watching for the defects in my limbs and in my feet, and noting just how agile I cavort around the floor, about like the way he used to do when he was forty-four. Then do the thing he shouldn't do, that strike a verbose poise, and tell the girls yet on my card of when us two were boys. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Tomorrow Will Be Fair by Ignatius Brennan. Read for LibriVox.org by Corey Michael Morrill. Tomorrow Will Be Fair. We've heard people say in a thoughtless like way, This world's a contrary old place, and they furthermore add, This old globule is bad. The worst we are knew in this case, we ask just one question. If this is the worst, pray you mention to others in which you are versed. We know there are times when the sweetest of chimes, great like the cracked fairy bell's tone, and the handsomest last isn't seen as she'll pass, this perhaps when we're planning alone. And how oft have we sat at the table so rich, with the choicest of food we'd prefer a sandwich? Again there are days when the bird softest lays, fall flat as the discordant note, when the bloom on the trees throw their sweet sense of breeze to clog like a lump in our throat. But these days to us never smack of despair, we have one set maxim, tomorrow will be fair. For then we'll have hours with the birds and the flowers, whether in chill December or June, as the thrush and the lark are for bright skies and dark, and we wheedle ourselves into tune. This morbid-like stuff isn't built on the square, just live with the hope that tomorrow will be fair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Human Yardstick by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Corey Michael Morrill The Human Yardstick Did you ever notice as you jog along the road of life, doing your full quota for a victory in the strife, working hard from morning to the setting of the sun, and then next day pitch in as if your work had just begun. You go to church on Sunday and sing tenor in the choir. You meet your obligations in a way that all admire. Your charities are legion, your gift hand never slow. 
You always have kind words for all, best charity we know. But no one ever pats your back and tells you just how good you did this thing or that thing in your own home neighborhood. And should some fond admirer speak so favorably of you, then answer could be well construed to mean, I guess he'll do. You have one chief besetting sin, perhaps that one is rum. The stuff that makes some wealthy and puts others on the bum. The stuff that makes the sellers, if successful, mighty rich, but takes the main consumers and prostrates them in a ditch. Now you've been good for oh so long, you've done your duties well, yet no one ever sings your praise or of your virtues tell. But fall from off the water van and hit old rum a crack. Though you're a thousand miles from home, the news will beat you back. And when you've rounded to and right side up with care, why then? You'll get more heart to hearts in this, you've fallen off again. Your virtues may be numberless, your vice is only one. But by this one you're measured when the measuring is done. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Lost Umbrella by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by April 6090, California, United States of America I had a silk umbrella once. T'was silk of highest grade. Guaranteed as such, and, too, fast colors will not fade. It had my monogram in script upon a silver plate. Silk tassels, fast to silken cords, made handsomely to mate with splendid goods and workmanship that made best harmony twas given as a present that's how it got to me i had another one at home fast black the day twas sold but kept on growing jaundiced as it kept on growing old twas only used on rainy days and did its turn quite fine and no one ever questioned if it twas borrowed or twas mine i kept the silk one to be used to make the right display at some swell ball or function that some time might come my way. It came. I dressed from shoe to tile in all the duds I had. All shaved and shorn, the glass displayed me looking not so bad. I took my silk umbrella down. The taxi came on time. It took me to the banquet hall, where all were looking prime. My overcoat and hat were hung upon an idle hook. The silken gift was hung just back. I had a second look. When the courses all were finished and the speakers all were through, I tarried just a little, which is always right to do. That is when you've been on the bill to do a special turn. This tearing stunt is done because you always like to learn just how you took. I then strolled out to don my things and go. My coat and hat were there, but my prized umbrella? No. I have a handsome friend who spent the evening at the hall. Initials that could look like mine when monogrammed and all. He has a silken shower stick that does one good to see. I know just how and where t'was got, and likewise so does he. But the other yellow comrade that I carried when t'would rain will still be doing service till I get a gift again. And I'll gamble one plug nickel should that cherished day e'er come that he who swipes my parachute will have to figure some. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Microbic Kiss by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona We're told there are microbes in the kiss And scientific chaps have said That we should stop this act of bliss And just say howdy-do instead they tell us the deceitful germ lies lurking in the nectar, just waiting its right to confirm, like any other deadly worm that brings its awful specter. They hold aloof the woeful tales to knock the wind from out our sails. They tell us how the handshake ain is not the safest thing to do, that parasites may vent their spleen by transferring to me or you. Some dreadful malady, say, like the smallpox or consumption, as none can tell where these may strike, then why not build the proper dike and work on the presumption that shaking hands is bad enough, but osculation horrid stuff. Now we like science pretty well and bank a whole lot on its say, 
but when it sounds the kisses knell we start to dope another way we knew these lads who looked askance and wondered bout the nectar being safe to take a chance without the approved cognizance of some professed inspector these chaps died young their love springs dried and no one mourned them when they died experience in any line does teach us in the best degree and we come out plunk and decline this microbistic theory and say we know a little bit of kisses smacked at random and tell of those that we've seen fit to get by way of perquisite the sort delivered tandem and well we're big and strong you bet and believe in osculation yet End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When Doctors Disagree by Ignatius Brennan, read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. I had a pain one time, you know, not one of these that come and go, but one that proved a sticker, and every one I met would tell to me the dope to make it well from epsom salts to liquor each made me think his cure was right i'd always take a dose that night the pain waxed on from bad to worse sometimes i'd pray again i'd curse till i grew chill and placid i then consulted dr brown who told me i was all run down and full of uric acid he told me what i must not eat to bring about a cure complete i mustn't tackle pork or lamb must draw the line on cheese and ham and any and all fishes a little beef say once a day brown till the juice had cooked away must cut out all those dishes containing starch the things i'd eat just vegetables sour or sweet i slipped around to dr smith who called dr brown a caveman myth regarding diagnosis he told me eat what e'er i please of ham and lamb and beef and cheese as i'd tuberculosis and as that meant well all know what to cut my food was tommy rot i then said sadly to myself here's where i blow my stock of pelf for this or that i'd fancy along the eating line and too i'll hit a little special brew even though it makes me dancy i started in and first dash out tried beer and beans and tripe and kraut now after gorging till my straps were let out quarter foot perhaps i called a cab and mentioned to the bunch who saw me go here's where i quit this earth below though truly unintentioned i thought when morning's bees would hum that i would be in kingdom come the morning came i heard the call of breakfast ready one and all and coming with much bosage i rose and dressed and felt first rate i piled fried spuds upon my plate with buckwheat cakes and sausage my folks who watched would sorta of chide me long the lines of suicide now this was years and years ago so long my memory fails to know exactly and i'm truthful when i tell you that from that day i ate whatever came my way and while i am not youthful i feel i'm very much alive though verging on towards forty-five end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Jeva Move by Ignatius Brennan, read for LibriVox.org by Maria de Fatima da Silva. Jeva Move. Now I don't mean if some policeman tells you to, or move because he's after you, or move when some high power machine is about to catch you near the spleen because its course you'd disapprove the question asked is did you ever move i did and in strict confidence i want to sympathize with those who've packed their kitchenware and clothes beds and bedding ornaments of big and little consequence window trimmings curtains blinds and bric-a-brac a hundred kinds then tear your wardrobe all apart unscrew the dresser mirrors fine and wash stands follow next in line now pack the books you know by heart with others 
you've ne'er seen the start take up the carpets beat them too so far and staring up you're through on comes the boys with moving van and grab your treasured furniture with grabs no mortal could endure then according to their latest plan out along the curb so's all may scan from stem to stern just what you've got piano on to cooking pot next to the new house round the square your treasured heirlooms onward jog whereat they're piled on mass agog while you look calmly on and swear and yank your fast departing hair to think where this or that was packed at length give up demoniac no use to dilate further here on putting things in place once more for that well follows but before again in this role i appear i'll jump this cursed hemisphere and go to dear old zuzuland where bamboo tents are simply grand and where to be in latest style adjust your belt and sweetest smile end of poem this recording is in the public domain books lent but by ignatius brennan read for LibriVox.org by april 6090 california united states of america we had a book a cheap affair it cost a dollar three we bought it from a second hand in washington d c now as for the material that made the book itself it wasn't worth the time it took to put it on the shelf but my the contents old and rare and out of print long ago a perfect stradivarius as violinists know we read reread time time again until its every page was ours we knew we had annexed the writings of a sage but when we know these splendid things they never do the good we care for until we've dispensed around the neighborhood the knowledge that we get by chance as in this case we told its teachings to our neighbors they enjoyed it young and old we had a friend she lived next door a mrs burke by name a stellar literary light outside the hall of fame could quote the gems from chaucer down to swinburne thout a hitch or on on back to homer through the intervening niche why virgil's enid to her was not e'en an antique she borrowed this prized book of mine to be returned next week the week went by no mrs burke we hear she went away to visit friends in montreal and more at hudson's bay she took the book along for her perusal while en route to dig down through the dirt and clay and hoist the diamonds out six months from then she came back home she told me about the book she'd lent it to her cousin kate who'd gone to sandy hook the days now lengthened into weeks the weeks ran into years a card came in from cousin kate while cruising round algiers it read dear cousin all are well i wish that you were here oh yes the book i'll simply state it surely is a dear i lent it to miss mary flynn just off for donegal she'll mail it back when through with it your cousin kate that's all well mary must have lent that book to mary ann kehoe just off for honolulu by the way of borneo and mary ann in turn has led it to the wild man who has sent it to a fiance in fiji or zulu well mrs burke is still a friend but she knows by our looks that she has one rare volume sandwich in amongst her books end of poem this recording is in the public domain the day that he turned up his toes by ignatius brennan read for librivox org by maria fatima da silva he was sure that this old world would stop stone still the day that he turned up his toes the waters would dry in the ever-flowing rill the day that he turned up his toes the crops would all wither the stock die of thirst the birds from the treetops would sing at their worst from breathing hot air we would swell up and burst the day that he turned up his toes stocks would go tumbling and banks go to smash the day that he turned up his toes 
Business firms fail from the lack of hard cash the day that he turned up his toes. The tides would all ebb without ever a flow. The stars would cease giving their glorious glow. Morals would run so depravedly low the day that he turned up his toes. The choir he directed would never strike a note from the day that he turned up his toes. No man in his state would know just how to vote from the day that he turned up his toes. There'd be none to head the grand march at the ball, nor Halloween pranks on each succeeding fall. In truth, this whole sphere would be nothing at all from the day that he turned up his toes. But could he now view from his home in the skies the day that he turned up his toes? The reels are now rivulets greater in size now that he's turned up his toes. The banks all declare the same trite dividend. Business goes on with the same steady trend. The tides ebb and flow as they'll do to the end, though he's wholly turned up at his toes. The birds sing as sweet and the stars shine as bright, although he has turned up his toes. We vote for our men when they've seen us all right, though long since he's turned up his toes. The choir he directed and doted upon sings better than when he egoed his baton. In fact, we believe they're all glad that he's gone, himself and his whole bunch of toes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Old State is Dry by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould The 5th of November we long will remember as being the day that they put the state dry. So dry that we're thinking, those fond of their drinking, will not now be licensed to drink on the sly. Such scrapping we never have seen, and if ever we pass through that same royal battle again, We'll hike to the mountains and sip of the fountains that nature divined for the primitive men. And one must lapse rigid to jump to the frigid when once he'd been courted by John Barleycorn, and a forced endeavor that courtship to sever, and two on that much dreaded following morn. We're frank in confessing it sets us to guessing just how the majority piled up so high, because twas so rarely when tested out squarely you'd find this or that one so perfectly dry. In traveling over our state we'd discover a man now and then of the tendery kind, but show him a swallow of old possum hollow, twas rather refreshing the change in his mind. We'd off put on trial our trustiest file when running quite low and no wet section nigh to meet in condition one of prohibition who'd cause us to say to our bottle, Goodbye. But why this discussing and aftermath fussing, the sovereign people almost to a man have said, Mr. Boozer, come, be a good loser. In 1914 you adopt a new plan. All right, says friend Boozer, I'll be a good loser, by knowing as long as red liquor is made, and I've the big cartwheel that tumbles the mart wheel, I'll get it e'en though I'll not bank on the grade. And too I have noted the lad who has voted because his wife told him to put the state dry, and should he e'er quiz me about some good whiskey, I'll tell him of mine. Nothing doing, say I. Should my country cousin come round me a buzzin' bout having the cramps or some other like ill, I'll say, go to thunder, you snowed the thing under, go sip of the water that turns the old mill. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mistress Jekyll Hyde by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Leah Autry July twenty ninth, 2018, St. Louis, Missouri I had seen her name oft in the papers, as hostess or guest here and there. She acquitted herself in a manner that smacked of the qualified air. The cold type portrayed her as charming in gowns these occasions demand. The pen picture left this impression, the luckiest man in the land. This man who had won such a partner for life, this cultured, this handsome and sunshiny wife. 
I called at her door as a stranger. I gave a soft touch to her bell. I waited and longed for her coming because I had something to sell. And to my eyes longed for a feasting they ne'er had partaken before. So I stood in the sunshine and waited just outside this happy one's door. She came, and the furies of old pagan fame alongside of her would be mellow and tame. I proffered my card. "'Twas a proffer. I still have it, far as she's concerned. Endeavored to tell her my mission. My brightest endeavors were spurned. A mad Bruin's gaze is angelic, compared to the one in this case. The enamel all crazed on her features as bang went the door in my face. I flew from that house as from some dread disease, with a dam in my mind and a knock in my knees. Her husband and I got acquainted. We quaffed oft of liquid that's red. Between quaffs we have waxed confidential. I must not give out all he said. But at times he has whispered, Virago, Xantippe, the vixen, likewise. Then call for more spirits for menti. To me this was not a surprise. And we both agreed from our souls to our dome, some angels at large are not angels at home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Soliciting Cash Subscriptions by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Noah Martin Did you ever collect? That is, to collect cold cash for elections in any respect. When no one is giving a small Grecian dam, who wins or who loses? Now that's where I am. Just at the present, soliciting cash to keep the old party from going to smash. You know, this collecting's a delicate thing when your party is out and you're minus the ring. And when the Mazuma's inclined to be true and sticks to its love like proverbial glue. Again, doubting Thomas's ponder and quiz, how much is your rake-off for doing the biz? You sit at your desk, for you make the first start. And you run down the list that you know so by heart. Then you dope the amount that you know you will get. From this one and that, the donation is set. You rig out your paper all typewritten, so, and for once in your life, you go out for the dough. The Joneses you figured for fifty apiece have joined the Browns and departed for Greece. The Millers and Barlows, the Caseys and Canes, the Pickets and Dailies, the Cooks and Zanes, the Krogans and Fays, the McGuires and O'Shea's have gone to the country for forty-five days. The Krauses and Strausses, the Kleins and the Rose are in Philadelphia buying spring clothes. The Schneiders, the Dushes, the Strobels, the Schwalbs, McGregors, McFarlands, the Grants and the Robs. The French politicians, Italians, and all are gone, to be gone till long late in the fall. The lads you figured for twenty at least contribute a five. They're just back from the east. Some more will subscribe with a spirited dash. So much, but we fail to lay eyes on the cash. Others will fritter and bluster and fuss, as if they were loaning the money to us. But we also find those who'll go down in their hip and peel off a ten at a one fifty clip, then hand you the names of another half score who give and say ring if you need any more. Cause these lads are scarce, but we find them a few. It's a hell of a task prying off the Mizzou. Now, if I meet some piker, on next Friday week, if we've been defeated, and he dares to speak by way of, Why didn't you do it this way? Or other remarks not congenial that day, especially if he's been tight with his kale. I'll hit him, if judge gives me six months in jail. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Jimmy Jones by Ignatius Brennan, read for LibriVox.org by Noah Martin.
Jimmy was a thrifty lad, not so long ago. Anything he'd want, he had. Made a handsome show. Dressed in just the latest style. Always wore a pleasant smile, we would have you know. Jimmy owned a motor car. Climb most any hill. Jim was rightly popular. Well, he paid the bill. Friends? Why, he had friends to burn. Jostled them at every turn, according his goodwill. Dance was never a success. Less our Jim was there. Cards or cribbage on chess. Played with knowing air. Sing? Just like a mockingbird. Sweetest voice you ever heard. Church or anywhere. Handsome? Huh. Well, I should say, eyes just rightly brown, hair to match. Let's see, he'll weigh about 200 pounds. Height, not less than six feet two. Trims an aspen, head to shoe. Match nowhere around. Jimmy was a graduate of a school of law. None could match him in debate. Stood without a flaw, amongst his peers, for all well knew. Jim was finished through and through, so they stood in awe. Jimmy tackled politics, let his business go. Mixed with Jews and Dutch and mix. Hunky and Dago thought he'd made the real slam with the festive sons of ham, like some more we do. Jimmy bought the boozerine, ale and Dublin stout, placed a little lengthy green here and thereabout, fought like valiantest of men, till the polls were closed, and then Jim was down and out. Jimmy's motor car is sold, bank account is gone. Jimmy's silver, Jimmy's gold, can't be counted on. Jimmy's now a common slob, wondering when he'll get a job. Other fellow won. He knows what Lincoln said of war. Cletus Hauser, too. Knows he's what they played him for. But he's game all through. Jimmy's young. He'll hit the track. Mark our word that he'll come back. Some, it seems, must get a whack, for they learn to hew. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Vacation Time by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Noah Martin There's not a doubt about it that vacation time is on. Some are just beginning, while more are through and done. Others, well, are neither, still vacating, so to speak, and riding home for money, so's to stay another week. Some go to the mountains where the cooling breezes blow. Some select the seashore where the tides all ebb and flow. Others, well, go neither, but are thoroughly content to hit their country cousins where it doesn't cost a cent. This vacating's quite a puzzle when we stop to think it o'er, of whether it's the mountain or the silvery sanded shore, or pick some quiet section where your country can folk dwell and spend your time in leisure by the brook or in the dell. Now, as for us, the mountains have a most specific charm, as we ne'er kick on the seashore, where the sands are nice and warm, and we love the quiet country, where the lambkins run and skip. But the chiefest, mean enigma, is the cash to make the trip. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Awful Halloween by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by April 6090, California, United States of America An Awful Halloween, Absolutely Untrue Way back a thousand years ago, when Halloweens were young, and spooks and fairies all the go, in climes of every tongue, I knew a bunch of girls and boys, high school folks by the way, who entered into all the joys, like girls and boys today. And these folks sought the castle where the glass reflected true. The face of him or her right there, they'd plight their fortunes too. 
but when they reached the castle just imagine their surprise the glass was gone they saw they must employ the witch's eyes one girl got a general another got a sailor one a farmer thin and tall and one a big fat tailor and still another got a clerk and one a quaker preacher a real bad girl drew a turk and one a high school teacher one boy saw plain a suffragette another a virago one drew my lady minuet who led the dance in dago another got a chic soubrette so full of fun and laughter the best boy drew a cook you bet was happy ever after but one poor moundsville high school lass who let a dozen chances pass because she was supposedly witty and some knave told her she was pretty saw in that witch's mirrored eyes to her chagrin and her surprise the man that she must surely wed his name just mr pumpkinhead end of poem this recording is in the public domain to woodrow by ignatius brennan read for librivox dot org by elaine conway england please don't lay the blame on margaret or miss bones her cousin dear or the troubles you've encountered in this most eventful year don't announce that you were lonely as some widowed turtle dove come out open and above board say i simply fell in love speak out plain like this twas edith those dark eyes and darker hair made me step a willing victim into cupid's pleasant snare say you helped arrange the trappings fixed the bait upon the stick placed your own heart on the trigger and you're glad you turned the trick war and other tribulations well may roam this old world through but damn cupid's always neutral makes no odds what others do with his bow and love-tipped arrow he keeps up his endless chase bringing home like fair diana choicest game from every place in advance congratulations though we all can't be on hand we'll attend alike in spirit everywhere in our fair land at your wedding and friend woodrow we're not much for noise and fuss for that dinner you'll have turkey why not take that bird on us October 1915 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. How We Took in the Fair by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Elaine Conway, England Did we go over? Well, now we should say we did joined in the throng so resplendent and gay we did started right in to enjoy every phase of it found there were times we were lost in the haze of it first on the ferris wheel all fairs abound with it then on the ponies the merry-go-round of it saw the snake charmer and made goo-goo eyes at her and miss la Turca were stuck on the size of her sat by the fat girl not one bit afeard of her and she of the whiskers and pulled at the beard of her spied thomas thumb and the giant from borneo and he one time was a texas attorneyo saw miss electro and watched the sparks fly from her envied her not though twas like eating pie for her talked with the wild man from o'er in tasmania found him a native of york pennsylvania chewed with a dutch clown so full of frivolity name michael flynn from the isle of much jollity drank lemonade of acidic acidity sold by those boys of such humble timidity munched on hot weenies until we felt doggish like hamburger steak till we lapsed to the groggish like 
crunched on hot peanuts done o'er from the fair before limburger cheese you could smell for a square or more quaffed a few mugs of the lager variety blew off the foam with our old time propriety dug up the shell game and took a few tries of it misjudged the ball on account of the size of it shot at the coon through the canvas twas fun galore threw at the babies and missed like we'd done before bought fifty rings at the cane rack and truthfully wasted them all in a manner so youthfully then to the grandstand not one bit aghast to us sat till our lingerie trousers stuck fast to us saw charlie walsh sailing round in his aeroplane hope this same charlie comes back to our fair again watched every race from the start to the finishing cheered with an ardour not least wise diminishing lost our last cent on a horse named jim hemmer old reason the jockey was garbed in pure emerald and then hoofed it home as was always our way of it satisfied happy we'd had a great day of it dear old state fair tis too bad that the manual stoutly maintains that you only come annual had we our way we would change the whole call and then have one in may and one more in the fall again end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Opposites by Ignatius Brennan Read for LibriVox.org by Elaine Conway, England You see a couple on the street, he measuring about six feet, and weighing close one twenty-five, she walking alongside four feet ten, two hundred pounds plus twenty, then you're bound to murmur, Sakes alive! Did their thoughts run to endless bliss when making such a mess as this? You see another couple too. She just about five inches through the belt line and five feet eleven, and he four feet from hip to hip and one foot more from top to tip. Then you Avil say, How under heaven came about this awkward match? they each made one tremendous catch again you'll see another pair she spick and span and debonair a fashion plate from sole to crown he rigged in hat and shoes old style and suit too large by one full mile the pants of which look coming down you can't but think where were her eyes when she made such a sacrifice and too you'll see some beau brummel always togged in clothes just swell the latest thing from old parry and she in some loose trailing skirt that fits but like our old night shirt waist hat and shoes of same degree you ponder ponder on and guess did she e'er wear a wedding dress but why concern then to our mind comes this old proverb love is blind perhaps tis best this is the case were we to use our microscope and with the love god try to cope he'd plan a way to win the race his plans we'd mutually approve so what's the odds as long as you love End of poem this recording is in the public domain